You guys got it? Yeah, I got it. So the death benefits, that's what we call the proceeds. We also call it the coverage. We also call it, uh, if they just simply tell it the insurance um, policy, the coverage, it doesn't matter. It just is the death benefit, that's the money the person will receive, the beneficiary is gonna get that, okay? Now, what about what we call um, fraud? Now, when you see the word fraud, you find fraud in any things out there. If you're starting for any other exam, people can fraud on that, okay? What fraud simply means is an intentional, it's intentional, okay? It's a misrepresentation. So it's intentional, it's a miss. When you see MIS mean not, representation means statements who are believed to be true. If it is misrepresentation, that means it's believed not to be true, but it's also intentional to try to deceive someone or something for value. That's called fraud. That's called it's a lie. Welcome, Alphonse and, and Amion. Hopefully, you guys can yeah, take some, some notes too. Okay. And if you guys have questions while I'm doing it, please, at any time, please stop me. Um, if you don't have question, it's not helping me out. Sometimes it's best you ask questions. This is a class. This is not our VP right now. This is a class. This is helping. This is the teacher. Yeah. Okay, teacher. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing is we're gonna go to the insurance policy. What is that? The insurance policy, it's the document that contain everything. The insurance policy is the contract. Okay, that's the contract. So now that's what have everything. And then I'm gonna explain to you about it as well. That's the insurance policy, is the document. Okay, insured. We talk about the insured. Is the person now that person is no longer an applicant? That person become it's either the person who own the policy or is it either the person life cover? Okay, the insured can be the same person with the policy on it, but sometimes it's not the same. The insured now that's a client. If you refer to it that way, that's when that person get approved. If you never get approved, you will always a proposed insured, but never an insured. Insurer, and I explained that already. Insurer, you're talking about the principal. So that's why they put that word next to it. Because the exams, usually what they do, teammates, okay? They try to trick you in the exam. If they can trick you enough, then you fail the exam and you get to pay them another 80 bucks, will be 80, uh, 44 dollars if you're a different, different say, which is a different price. So that's why you have to know those words so in case they try to trick you. So why do they call them the insurer? Why? They call them that because they issue insurance policy. Now, they don't just call them that. They don't just call them principal, you know, because it's a beautiful name. They call them that because they issue policy. If they don't issue policy, you're not an insurer. So you have to be willing to issue a policy for them to call you that. The next word is lapse. What is lapse? Lapse is the termination of coverage or payment. When you have to pay the hundred dollars that I had explained earlier, you pay a hundred dollars for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So that the hundred dollars that you pay, if you don't pay it, the policy will lapse. That's when it will terminate. Now, just be careful. That's the word you have to understand. Lapse. When it lapse, that's when the person didn't pay for non-payment of premium. You didn't pay your money. How do you expect you don't pay your money? You expect the company to pay your beneficiary. Pay your money first, then they will pay you. It's a contract. You respect your words, we're going to deliver. Now, if you don't respect your words, then I'll tell you, we ain't going to have you, okay? It's that simple. Life insurance. Life insurance, it's a coverage of human life. It's just to protect the person's life. They call it like that, okay? 
Let's take it as that. Policy owner. What is a policy owner? But now, what is the difference between the policy owner and the insured? Which is, this is the policy owner right here, and this is the insured right here. Now, those two can be the same. Uh, at the same time, they can be not the same. Let me see if it's coming into the space. Oh. Stuff like that. All right. So the policy owner is the person who own the policy. Now that person is entitled to exercise the right and privilege in the policy. Once you own, you see, the reason you can see the insured and the policy may not be the same person because if the policy owner is not the same with the insured, that's mean whoever owned the policy gets the control. For example. Let's say that I do a policy. Um, I don't think I'll use my friends. I don't think she, she not me. Let's say me and my friends were, you know, husband and wife, okay? Let's say that I do a policy on my friends. Uh, I cover her, okay? But she's the insured, but I'm the policy owner. Now, my friends can get mad. She cannot cancel the policy. I'm the only one that can cancel it because I control the policy. I am the policy owner. She is the entry. But something has to happen to her for the beneficiary to get something. But now, that's in me and my friends will no longer the same person. Now, listen to me carefully. Now, the insurance company, which is the, the insurer, going to say, why would Ernest put a policy on my friends? What is the relationship with them? Do they have something called insurable interest? If something happened with my friends, would it affect Ernest financially? So because we married, so of course she will affect my money. So I have the right to put an insurance on her. And she has the right to put an insurance on me. That's called insurable interest. So at the minute the policy with the insurance is not the same, you're going to have a question. It was a question right away. And then I might ask you, if the policy owner and there is two different people, then what would be the next? The next thing the insurance company wanted to know, why would they do that? Is there any insurable interest? And it must exist at the time of the application. Now, while I'm on this, in this thing right here, because I may not know if I'm going to cover it too much, because let me explain to you. The insurable interest is if somebody dies, he will affect you financially. He will affect your money. Oh, yeah, you better put an insurance on that person. And simple. So now, who have insurable interest? Okay, I can put a policy on myself. So I have insurable interest in myself. I don't need somebody's permission because it's myself. Because if something happened to me, it will affect my money, so I can put insurance on me. Same thing if uh, Alexandra can do the same thing. Same thing Malfas can do. Same thing Edwin can do. Because anybody, when you buy the insurance, that's it is because you don't want to affect your money. You transfer the risk from you to the insurance company. Or possibility of losing something of value. There's something of value, it's money. So therefore, we need to make sure we get that taken care of. All right, so as far as that goes, so now if the policy owner is not the same, so that we have that question, and also now, can I put an insurance on and, and my husband? Yes. Can I put an insurance on my wife? Of course. Can I put an insurance on my dad? You bet. Can I put an insurance onto my kids? Yes. Can the kids put insurance on me? Of course. Can my employer put an insurance on me? Nope. Unless if you are a key person. If you are a key person, yes, they can put an insurance on you. Because if something happens to you as a key person, you're going to affect them financially. Yes, they have the right to do it. Okay, can two business partners put insurance on each other? Yes, they can because they have insurable interest. But the business must exist. Insurable interest have to exist at the time of the application. Now, what about if you go borrow money? You borrow like $100,000 from someone. 
Can that person manage funds? Because now, when you go about the money, you are the borrower or the debtor, but the person become the creditor or the lender. So the lender have insurance and the debtor. So that's mean when you go borrow money, they can have the white people insurance fund you. That's no wonder if you go to the dealership, you go buy a car, you didn't go to buy life insurance, but the dealership people say, you know what, you have to put insurance on you. Now, even though that's called a credit life insurance, but that's still they're putting insurance on you because they have insurance in you. If something happened to you, they to ensure they can recoup their money. That's called insurable interest. And this is something that's important to know. So now, do you, do you guys have any questions? The premium is the money that you pay every month, okay? The premium is the money you pay every month. The premium. Are you there, Ernst? Can you hear me? I couldn't, but now I can. I said that, does anybody have any question about the term? Because sometimes what happens is if we do have a question, if you don't, if we guys don't get those terms first, when you see them, you will not understand the rest of the sections because you have to get those terms in the beginning so you understand what those terms mean. When you see them, when you're reading, then you know what they mean. I don't know if anybody else, but I get it. Right. Okay, now let's have some. Um, and now, if I don't cover everything, please, that's enough. I'm going to cover everything, okay? I'm going to cover as much as possible, but not everything, okay? Now, the first thing I'm going to cover with you is insurance. Why people buy insurance? The first thing you're going to see when people buy insurance, it doesn't matter if it is car insurance, it doesn't matter if it is home insurance, it doesn't matter if it is auto insurance. It doesn't matter if it's life insurance. Once you buy insurance, the only reason you do that, you transfer the risk or the loss from you, from the business, to an insurance company. That's all you're doing. So the best way to avoid risk is transfer. That's when you're buying insurance. Simple as that. You take it from you, you transfer it to the company. So if the person passes away, they, they uh, give you the money to make you whole again. Now, because you got also in your state, so you have to know this as well. Insurance is the transfer of risk. Insured losses are transferred over to the insurer. Okay? Now, the term insurance transaction include the following. Now, this is a, a section that in, in our state of Florida, we, we get this. Uh, not as early as possible like this, uh, and then hey, for you guys, you see they bring that right up front. Okay, an insurance transaction is when you do it. Now you have to make sure you know those four bullets. And the exam they might ask you, which of the following is an insurance transaction? When you do a solicitation, if you negotiate about like the term, about their whole life, about cash, about about how much, you, if you're doing those things. That's when you must be licensed. Because if you're not licensed, you're doing something illegal. Sales. Okay, if you're selling insurance, you better be licensed. Okay? Now, don't, don't, don't be surprised. Oh, well, I mean, if I got a term license, that's still licensed. It doesn't matter. Okay? So, advising individual about their coverage or claim. If you talk to people about their claim, about the coverage, hey, man, if you get this much, you can, no, that's, you need to be, that's an a, a transaction. So, you must be licensed. Those four bullets require you to have a license. Now, this is how they trick you. Now, listen to me now. Remember I said, if they can trick you enough and you get to fail the exam, you get to give them more money. They might say all of the following are insurance transaction except. But if you never know those are the transaction, you screwed up. Or they might say all of the following require a license, which one is not require a license, but all those four bullets. And they might say which of the following is an insurance action. Or they might say which of the following is require a license. They might just give you one. So just be careful. Just be careful. 
Just be careful. So that's mean is a transaction to make. Okay. The next thing, contract law. What is a contract? Can I have a contract with myself, Alexandra? Say it again, please. Can I have can I have a contract with myself? Yes. Let me see. Between two or more parties. No. Now you cannot have a contract with yourself. You have you have like hope or dream or wishes. <laughs> I just read it. I'm like, nope. Because, because if we if we do have contract, you know how many contracts we, we have with ourselves and then we don't respect them? Our self was going to bring our ass to jail. <laughs> <laughs> you you have to your country can say, yeah, you told you you say you are going to do this, you didn't do it. So I'm gonna give you a misdemeanor. I'm gonna give you a felony because you didn't respect what your words. You can't, <laughs> you can't, yourself not want to do that. Okay. So the <laughs> contract is between two or more people, and that's also enforceable by law. That's mean the law can get involved. That's mean we can get you from the district court to the Supreme Court all the way through. It's a contract. So you cannot have a contract just with yourself. Make sense? You have to be two or more people. Now, next thing is elements. What is the element to the contract? What is that? In order for a contract to be a contract, it must have those four essential elements. Number one, it must have an agreement. An agreement is an open acceptance. Now, teammates, listen to this carefully. Every time we submit a policy, we're making an offer. Okay, that's the agreement. Every time the company accepts us as a client, they, that's when they do the acceptance. Now, I see so many times people take, 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 try to go take that exam, and they say, who made, when was the offer made? When you submit the application. When they propose and should submit the application. And sometimes they stretch it, when does the acceptance, who does the acceptance? The underwriting department of the insurance company. So you as the proposition had nothing to do with the acceptance. The only thing you can do is to submit the offer. And for my Haitian people, I'm gonna just Haitian people that do that, Mexican people does that too. There is no counter offer when it comes to insurance. It's either you accept it or you don't. There is no negotiation negotiation in the price. Oh well, listen. Um, I said, I said it. Um, you say I'm gonna pay one hundred dollars. Well, can I just pay eighty? Can I just give you eighty for the same coverage? There's no such thing. Can't do that. Can't do that. Okay. So there is no counter offer. Now remember, who, who do I say make the offer? Mm. Question I have for y'all: Who do who make the offer? The agent. Oh, not the agent. Or the company, I don't know. No, the, the applicant, the client. Oh. Okay. okay, when do you make the offer? When you submit the application. Even though the agent submitted it for you, but it's when you submit it, that's when you make the offer. Get that? Mm -hmm. Who make the acceptance? This insurance company. When do they do that? When they approve the policy. Now, the, the way you're going to know they accept you is when they approve the cover. But the test question, when you say they will approve, that means they accept you. All right. So now, the other thing is number two, consideration. Now, why would the insurance co consider you? Okay. Why would the insurance company consider you? So the consideration mean in order for them to consider you, okay, so that you have to pay something called money, okay? If, if you don't give me my premium, I'm not going to consider you. But the consideration part of it, Alexandra and my friends and El Mion, okay, it comes two different ways. You as the applicant, as the client, you have your own consideration. And the insurance company have their own consideration. So now I'm gonna cover that in a minute, okay? And the next thing is 
competent party. In order for the contract to be a contract, it must be have competent party. Now, the person must be competent. They should not be under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And also, it must be legal purpose. It cannot be it's something for illegal purpose. You have to be for legal purpose. Now, let's go here. Offer and acceptance. So, when, remember, I already explained that. You make the offer when you submit what? The application. Now, when you see the word in bold, that means important. And the acceptance takes place when the insurer, which is the insurance company or the principal underwriter, approve the application and issue the policy. This has nothing to do with me as the agent. The insurance company take care of the acceptance. Question on that. But we're going back there. Once we go next, we'll go next. If you don't get it, you might as well tell me now, or then that hold your peace forever. <laughs> uh, the next thing is consideration. In order for them to consider consider you, and you have to bring something of value. The binding force of any contract is consideration. So consideration is something of value. In is something who? Something of value. That's mean money. Money. Value means money. Each party give to the order. So you give money. Remember the hundred bucks I say you pay every month. That's the premium. Okay, you give them the money. What are they gonna give it to you in return? Money. So see, I give you money for money. That's consideration. That's exchange of value. So the consideration of the part of the insurance. Now let me talk about you as the client. What is your responsibility? In order for them to consider you, number one, you have to pay the premium. Put that down. My consideration as a client or the insured, I have to pay the premium. Now, not whenever you want, on time. Sometimes you see people, they say, well, well the insurance doing bad things, but you didn't want to pay them. No, that's not how it works, baby. You got to give me my money. Okay, you didn't do your part. I'm not, I'm not going to respect my word if you don't do your work. Yours. And also part of the consideration that's the, the, is two things for you. Representation made in the application. So all the questions you answer, when they ask you, hey, do you have high blood pressure? Do you have stroke? Do you, do you smoke? Okay, how tall are you? What is your weight? What is this? What is that? That's, that was the representation. Representation, there are belief statements, okay? Statements that are believed to be true based on your knowledge, based on your knowledge. So now when you take the premium plus the representation, once those two things are correct, that's you do your part as the consideration for you as the proposed insured or the applicant. Then if you do sue, the insurance company consideration, they have to promise to pay the premium in the event of the loss. So that the second part you see, the only thing the company have to do is to pay you. But you have, you have two things to do, but they have one to do. You do your two parts, and they will do theirs. If you don't do yours, we're going to do ours. That's the main reason when we're going to go study chapter where it's talking about policy riders, you're going to see the consideration is part of the insuring clause. That's why it's all to the promise to pay. You die, we pay. This is called the insuring clause because consideration is part of it. It's part of the insuring clause. So now, this is you. You say, know this. See, the exam say, know this. Tell me, Alexandra, you didn't see it. You say, know this. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Insure consideration is the promise to pay for losses. But the ancient consideration is the premium and the statement on the application, which is believed to be true. That's the, what that is. So if the statement are not true, then I can consider you. It is that they ask you, do you have a blood pressure? Do you think in the prescription? You say no. So that means you violate the consideration clause, so the company has no right to give you the coverage. That's a lie. Question on that? No, I'm taking no. Alphonse, you don't say nothing. Are you paying attention? Yes, I am. I'm here. All right, because you guys have a lot of money on the table. You better pay attention with this. <laughs> you better pull that money, all this money out. 
And give me. So, yes, focus. I wish Mitani was there. She could get some. Uh, let's go to competent poly. Competent poly. So now the competent poly, okay. The competent poly to the contract must be capable in turn into the contract in the eyes of the law. So in order for you to be in the contract, you have to be, they have to see you competent. Generally, this requires both poly to be legal age. Now, every state will have the difference, but I know for us in Florida, you have to be at least 15 years old to enter to do the contract, not to get licensed. Don't mistake this. Getting licensed, you must be 18. I think it's probably all across the board. You have to be 18 years old to get licensed. But to buy life insurance to get into the contract, you, ha you have to be at least 15 years old. So I'm sure it's probably the same way in um, all the other states. Mentally, you have to be mentally competent to understand the contract. You cannot be under the influence of alcohol. If you go do a policy for someone and they're under the influence of alcohol or drugs, please don't do it. Please don't do it. It's just like you go to somebody who's drunk. Oh, yeah, how much the policy is? Well, the policy can cost you don't care. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can pay that. I got it. I got it. I got it, man. Just do it. Just do it. Because he's drunk. You know what he's talking about. And once you wake up, you say, what? They just take two of them your, and for your life. And say, Excuse me? I never signed for a crap like that. Who did that to me? And they're going to find out it's you. And then they become under the influence of alcohol. And the policy will be voided. Voided means the policy will get canceled. Yeah, as long as they can prove. It was not done right, so they can do that. Competent policy. Legal purpose. Well, you have to be legal. Simple as that. You cannot get a policy. You know what? I'm going to kill somebody, so that's why I put the policy on them. Please, 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 stop it. You have to be legal. If it is the act of illegal, and that's why I find out at some point when people do have a felony, it's hard for them to even get policy, even though they might have good people, but they don't give it to them. It's crazy. My bargain. Oh, well. If there comes something illegal, I don't know about that one. Number two, distinct characteristic of insurance contract. Okay, now I want you to pay a little, little attention. So we don't do the term. Hopefully everybody got it. You got it, Alex? Alex? Yeah, I'm here. Do you have any questions or are you good? No, I'm good. All right, there's some other things come to insurance contract. They say that insurance, they are contracts of adhesion. The word adhesion mean take it or leave it. You don't like it, okay, you don't need to accept it. Don't say, oh, you don't like the words, the way they write them, or the color they are, why they're so small. Oh, if you don't like them, it's okay. Let us keep our contract, you keep your money. You have no say on it. That's the reason any ambiguities in the contract, that's in any mistake, any errors, anything that's not good, that's misleading, they're going to always treat the favor of the ancient because they never prepare the contract. So they will also in favor of me. If I'm the client and something is wrong, so they're going to know, hey, it's your for the insurance company because I have nothing to do with that. You caused that to happen. So you have to take care of it. That's called, is an Haitian contract. Take it or leave it. You have no say on it. So I, I hear you mean take it or leave it basis. You can either accept it or reject it. You can either accept it or reject it. You get that? Good teammates. You guys good? Yes. Alitory. Alitory. What is alitory? Alitory is, you remember when I was showing the example? When you pay a hundred bucks and the company gonna give you 150, does a hundred dollars equal 150,000? When would that have at you? Never. In what book? Nobody book. So that's when the value are not equal. That's what Alitory means. You will never get what you pay for. It will never match exactly of what you're going to receive. So insurance are auditory. It doesn't matter if it is a car insurance. 
It doesn't matter if it is a health insurance. It doesn't matter if it is a, a home insurance or life insurance. They're just simply auditory contract. Unequal value. What you pay will never be equal. Oh, well, I'll be having probably this for 30 years. Who cares? Do 30 years. Okay, time that 100, see how much it is. So that's 200 times 30 years. For 150, it's still not going to be equal. Is it going to be more or going to be less? It's not going to be equal. That's called unequal value. Okay, here's how they do it. They might give you a scenario like this because the exam is scenario based. And this is how they're going to trick you. John purchased a life insurance policy for $100,000. His monthly premium is $100. At the minute you see this, it die in the next two months. So you already know this is auditory right there because 100 that equal what? 100,000. That's called auditory. You don't need, don't pick adhesion contract. That's auditory right there. It's that simple. It's that simple. Is this video, you guys can go watch that. I'm not gonna watch that. You guys can go watch that. I just show you what the auditory means. Any question on that? Now, next thing is unilateral contract. So insurance policy. Uh oh. Sorry. Me? Sorry. Insurance policy is unilateral. Okay. What does unilateral mean? It's just that uni mean one. So that's why sometimes people that in the Bible say John 3 6 saying, For God to love the world that he gave his own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but in the French version, it's a unique, unique in the French version. That's mean one. When you see you, you and I, it's mean one. That's mean insurance are unilateral contract. What does the one mean? It's only one party make promise, which is who make the promise? The insurance company. You die, we're gonna promise we're gonna pay. That's why you can take them to jail. That's why you can take them to court. That's why they can get penalized because hey, you say this was a contract, you promise this. If something happened, hey, I'm gonna hold you accountable for this. If not, I'm gonna seek for lawyers. They, we can sue, we can do this, we can do that. And if you really do it that bad and really big deal, they can even go get jail sentence. It's unilateral contract. You see, the insurance company promise, but look at us. What did you promise? Even the premium you don't have paid on time. You didn't promise nothing. That's why you do that. Little. Other than that, they were going to change it. So we don't promise that we're going to pay them, but they promise they're going to pay us. That's what you need that little contract means. The insurance company promised to pay the death benefits. Can you go over that one more time? I didn't really get it. Uh, I said you need that little mean you need mean one, one. one party to the contract make a promise. Okay, so one, which is the insured, make no legal, you see, no legally blind binding promises. You don't make no promise. But I can like don't understand the first paragraph. Only one of the parties do the contract is legally bound. Yes, anyway. that's been only one party to the contract. You mean like only one person can make um decision about the contract? No, 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 no. Only one party mean just think about it, just take the one party. That's mean only the insurance company. That's what that's saying. Only the insurance company to the contract is legally bound to do anything. Only the insurance company. Don't see Polly as a human being, you or me. No. They're talking about just specifically referring to the insurance company. Okay? Mm -hmm. Is that? So only the insurance company, only the, you can take this one out, only the insurance, insurance company is legally bound to do anything. So if everybody here speak Creole, that'd be great. I could give you tips here. Do you guys, do you guys, um, everybody here speak real? I don't know what the is. Yes.
Now, let me ask you a question, Alex, right? Mm -hmm. You have a conscience. Which, which company? Progressive. Progressive. Did you promise you're going to pay the, the, the payment next month? Yeah. No, you're not. Because if you don't pay them, they ain't going to put you to jail. Okay? I don't promise, but they just take it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> if I have any future in your bank account, can they go to the other bank and take it? No. Can they go after you to sue you? No. Huh? Can they go after you to sue you? No. no. What happens if you have a car accident and you have full COVID and they say they're not paying? Can you sue them? Yeah. Okay, see, that's what that means. That's exactly what that means. So that's when legally, you, they have to pay legally. You can make them, legally, you can take them to court, make them pay if they don't want to pay you. But legally, if you don't pay your premium, they don't have to do that. They don't have to do that. That's what that means. All right, so let's go to the next term. Let's go to the next term. Um, conditional contract. It's also a conditional contract. What is conditional mean? When you see the word conditional, there is a word that means that if. If you see the word if somewhere into a test question, that's a condition. If this happens, this will happen. Condition means certain condition must be met. So now, what is your condition? Well, you better make sure you pay me. If you don't pay me, I will pay you. When something happens to you, I will pay you. Okay, so that's the condition. But, but if you lie on the application, but we can decline you, that's the condition. If you don't do your exam, because you applied for the insurance coverage, but you didn't do your exam, well, we have the right to deny you. You didn't respect the condition. You violated our condition. Condition does simply mean certain condition must be met. Question I think this is, is, is straightforward. Let's go number three. What is representation and warranty? Now, some people might see this word, those are like word that they compose those words. Um, representation, they are statements. Both of those are statements. Warranties, they are statements. But there's a big difference. Representation, they are believed to be true. Let's say that if I go buy an iPhone into Apple, and I go to the Apple store, I get me an iPhone. And the salesman says, man, this iPhone 11 Pro, baby, it's the best you could ever buy. This thing is great. I'm telling you, best believe me. Even though he's there, he's not even own one. He got an Android. <laughs> but he said, hey, you better take my word for it. It's a great phone. Okay, even though I don't use it, but it, I know it's great. <laughs> this is called representation. They are believed to be, that's his belief, okay? Believed to be true, okay? They are believed to be true. It's just like you ask the client, do you have blood pressure? Oh, no, no. Have you ever get sick? No, no, never. Never get sick. And because I say, no, no, man, I tell you, I guarantee you I never get sick. And you take that word from the, from the client? Because never go to the hospital, that's when he's not sick? Please, give me a joke. You would probably walk in bed. <laughs> so, so if you say that, oh, well, that's when they give you some warranty. Hey, man, I'll tell you, I never get sick, man. I'll tell you, I promise you, man. I'm, I'm good, man. Everything's straight to me. Okay. <laughs> and then oh, the half the question is always killing them, okay? <laughs> they always have a they always have a cold, but never sick, okay? I guarantee you, man. Bro, just do it. I'm telling you, I promise I'm good. That's a warranty. A warranty is an absolute true statement that is given as a guarantee. In our state here in Florida, there is no such thing called a warranty when it comes to insurance. Everything is representation. Believe to be true. Believe to be true on one knowledge. So every time we see representation, is believed to be true, not a warranty. A warranty is a guarantee statement to be true. 
But in representation, it's a belief statement that believed to be true. Yeah, I believe you, man. Yeah, you never get sick. Yeah, I believe you. But in my mind, says, you look sick to me. <laughs> okay? It's an untrue statement. What is that? Misrepresentation. So if representation is a true statement, MIS, which is misrepresentation, that's mean it's an untrue statement. Now, if the representation becomes misrepresentation and it could void the contract, that's when it can stop the contract or eliminate the contract or terminate the contract or cancel the contract, okay? Now, in material misrepresentation, now this is material now. That's when there is something that you are supposed to disclose, you not disclose it. You will hell. It's just like somebody asks you, if you ever have a heart heart attack, you know you have a mini one. Well, it doesn't matter if you have a mini. A mini is still a heart attack. When you come to ancient, that's a mini, that mini, mini, mini. Okay, it's still that. So they, yeah, that would that would make a big shift. Okay, this might ask you, have you ever smoked? No, never smoked. But you know, last night, you know, I smoked, but not that. I just every every now and then I just take a cigar, a cigar, I just try. It. Okay, even I, maybe I, I use some um, uh, notebook paper. I, I just use as a cigarette. I don't care, bro. That's still that's that's still important. Because once we put you smoke, your insulin is going to be three times as high, then uh, that's trying to deceive them. That's intentional. And you know you did smoke. So we tell you for this intentional statement, and then that will lead to that. Material misrepresentation, that will lead to intentional, and that will consider fraud. So that's four different words. Representation, believed to be true, based on one person knowledge, okay? Believed to be true. A warranty, it's also a, station, a statement, okay? That consider a warranty, that means it's an absolute true statement, okay? A misrepresentation, it's, a, it's also a statement, except that statement is not true, okay? Now, a material misrepresentation, that's also a statement, not only is just not true, but you also do it intentionally, in purpose. So that's fraud. And you're gonna see those questions throughout the test, all right? Let's go next. A question on that? So good. You can go with those as well. See? Cancer or tumor? No, I don't. No. <laughs> okay, so you can see this guy. You can watch that video yourself, all right? Notice representation are statement believed to be true. Ensured statement are in the application are representation. So that's mean on your state, that's what it is. Just like it was in here. So now you get down to this all statements including you that telling me you guarantee you're not sick okay i agree with you but i would never accept that as a warranty that you know that because of that i think oh well yeah that person that's a great client <laughs> okay so all statements made into an application for insurance in the state of here florida or rhode island that's called they are representation that's when they are believed to be true that's it. I'm done with that. Any question on that? No. All right. So now we're done with this part. So now let's go about how do we go completing that application. So now you learn you learn the term. Now see, it's, it's build up knowledge. Because now once you understand this concept, so you don't screw up the, the application in the beginning, that's why they we warn you about those first. Okay, now after you see all this beautiful stuff, now let's go ahead and put an application to practice. In the application, there is three parts. In C, you might see there is only two parts. Every state, I'm sure there is three parts, okay? But now for the test purposes, they might ask you about those two first, okay? The application, yeah, it's the basics way the insurance collecting information. So now basics are primary. So the best way, the first place they go to check is the application, not MIB, okay? Not your doctor's office. The first, the primary way they find out about somebody is into the application. That's what they go check first. But wait, if I don't have, do an application, why would you go check my health? Why would you do that? Okay, that's what the under, under, underwriting process is gonna start from. So part one, general information. So if they ask you on your test, What's in part one, you have to know is general information. But I wish they were asking it like that. That would be a baby test. That's for kindergarten. Now they consider you guys are grown-ups. 
They ain't gonna ask you what in part one or part two. That's too damn easy. <laughs> Everybody can remember that, okay? <laughs> so here's what they're gonna do. They're gonna give you a scenario. This is what you need to know. What's included in part one? Part one includes things like this. Name, age, address, birthday, gender, income, marital status, occupation. So where would you find those in part one? So in the, in, the, in the test question, they ask you, okay, where you would find this on the, on the application? The age, the date of birth. Okay, you have to know that's part one, general information. Now in part two, don't get this twisted because this is just simply in medical information. If you want to find out if the person have high blood pressure, where would you go? Part two. What happens if you want to see if they have diabetic or maybe the, what prescription they're taking? Maybe if they smoke, okay, where would you go? Part two, medical information. It's that simple. What is in part three? It's not in there. Hopefully it is. Part three is the agent report. Uh, see, it is a, now also you have to see here, it is the agent responsibility to make sure certain the application is filed out completely. So it's your job as an agent, okay? To make sure the application done correctly. Not the client, not the proposed entry. You have to take responsibility to make sure everything done correctly to the best on the applicant knowledge. The agent must also file, you know, on your ask proper question, okay? And also make sure that, you know, the client is not mis, you know, misleading the, this information or maybe doing this with representation or concealment. Concealment is, is when like they, they, they're telling the truth, but they're not telling the full, the full picture of it. It's just like, for example, if you tell somebody, well, I'm going to Walmart, but you know, after Walmart, you're going to Publix, but you didn't say, uh, yeah, I'm going out. I'm going out where, but I'm going to Walmart. But you know you're going to Walmart, you're going to Dollar Tree, you're going to Publix. And then that, that doesn't mean you lie, but as you you lie. You tell the truth, but not the full truth. Because you didn't tell the whole errand that you just stored. That's what happened in concealment. You tell the truth, but you hold some. Uh, the agent report um, is an observation. It's a personal observation that you make about the applicant. That's all. Let's say you go to a person and say, you know what? Do you smoke? And then the person say no. And when you're at the house and you see they got a cigar and they're smoking and you ask them, do you smoke? They say no. What would, you, what would I do, Alex? Alex, what would I do? What would you do? The person say no, they don't smoke. What would you put in the application? Is it yes, no question. What would you put, Alex? My friends, what would you put? If you ask the person the question, do you smoke? They say no, but you see them smoking. What do you, what, what you gonna put? <laughs> probably, probably yes. <laughs> yeah, see, that'd be great, but you can't do that. <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. I was gonna say I won't do it, but I won't fill the application. No, you have to fill the application. That's not your job to determine if they're gonna fly far or not. You see? That's crazy. It's oh. <laughs> like I see the person smoking. Yeah. You cannot say and the person said, I don't smoke, so I still feel the application like the person is not smoking? Of course. They say, no, no of course. Now, oh, yeah. Now, because if you do that, listen, you get, you're not allowed to deny them. That's not your job. The only thing you can do as an agent is to inform the insurance company about a, a behavior. Wow. But you can just inform. Does that make sense? You can inform. Now, what you do, that's where part three comes. Part three means is the agent report. So the, now you go to the agent report. That's called noisy. Now, that's when you be noisy. Okay. What face you that? Okay. Hey, listen. The eight, when I was sitting with the client, I asked, Do you smoke? He said, No. But when I was there, he was smoking. So I don't know what that means. But anyway, I'm just saying. That's what the agent report does. Wow. That's it. But you have to do the application. Okay, what about, okay, now, listen, listen to me. What about if you go out there and you ask somebody, you, 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 it's hard to ask somebody, what is your sex? Are you a male or a female? And you have to do your best with discrimination. And oh my goodness. If you don't know who's male, who's not female, who's female. You might go over there, you have, somebody have two good little things into their chest and then they, oh man, girl. <laughs> <laughs> How do I tackle that? 
How do I do that? How do I get out of that mess? I know. I can ask someone hey. But that's that's a question for sure. Okay, sure. Uh, and, I see that you sound let's say you go like just just like you said right uh, for this transgender people okay so how do they come out with something for them or how do you claim it on an insurance thing for them well, we're, gonna, we're gonna get to that in a minute okay so you okay. that person and then you see you, you there's no way i listen if i talk like this you know i'm a female that, that would be messed up uh, huh? you don't talk like ernest talking right now you can see that's a male voice Okay, you can but don't don't forget now they take hormone pills to make their voice. Uh, but if you look in the back of my neck, you can see that there's, there's coconut thing, boy. <laughs> you can see that, man. And I'll tell you that some of them look like female. Yeah, if you put in that talo kick it, man, you better see I'm not no damn female because the cadence is not. Damn, my goodness, because some people already have a female body. Ah, oh, man, you see, you see how you keep arguing with me the same thing. You see that? <laughs> <laughs> and you see that, right? And you, now you get to that, you that scenario. Now the only crap you can say, can I just make an action? Are you a man, damn it? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Lord of mercy. But you can't do that. What you can do is say, sir, can I see, um, excuse me, can I have your driver's license, please? It's the simplest way I can get. Whatever I have in your driver's license, that's what I put. Simple as that. Ah, uh, they didn't know that. Yeah. Oh no, I'm I'm, I'm a girl. If you ask them that, uh, both of them say, "Hey, no, no, I am the girl. <laughs> Put me in the car. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so whatever's on the ID, it's what you take. Wait, whatever you in the driving license. Whatever the driving license was. Boy, I can. Do oh, it. Whatever you get, that's your damn problem. I'm gonna hit the policy. I'm gonna do it. I will leave. <laughs> Okay, but anyway, so but that was that was the reason you have to make sure to do responsibility. All right, now these words can come up as well. Feel underwriter, okay? A feel underwriter is you as the agent. Now the un you see Phil, you in the field, underwriter, they the one that make the decision if the person gets approved or not. Now you as the field underwriter, you can have a pretty great idea. Like the other day. Uh, like this week, somebody called me. When you see people calling for insurance, man, boy, I'm telling you, I'm scared. <laughs> Some ain't right. We must be able to come for things like that, okay? So, and somebody called me and said, oh, man, I need some insurance. Uh, I, I was wanting to, somebody referred me to you that they in, she needs some life insurance. Oh, I thought that was hurting somebody because she sounded like, uh, like I said, fundamentally sound and then nothing went with her. Oh, I'm willing to do that. I said, man, I'm going to go and make me some money. <laughs> then she said, no, actually, the insurance is for my dad. I said, oh, oops, oops. My hook got cut up right there. Oops. Is that for your dad? Mm. That's been something here, yeah, right? Okay. Usually, when people call, something is under. Now, I cannot tell her they're not going to give it. They don't even do the obligation. I can discourage her not to do that. Here's what I told her. We can always try to send the application, but I have a pretty good chance it may not be able to get to. So if that come back the wrong way, please understand it. Don't take it personal. Don't get mad or anything like that. It's just part of the process. She said, okay. I said, do you understand that? Yeah. Because I already have a pretty good idea. Okay. That person won't get approved. And I did the policy, by the way. I did it. Okay, and I asked her because you remember I'm the field underwriter. So, but except I cannot the act up over the client or anything like that. So, based on all this question that she put it in, then I have to send the application in to the to the company. And the next day, teammates tell you that it ain't get approved right there. Next day. Mm. Okay, but I could not, but I could not, I cannot say, oh no, if I do that, that's been discrimination. I can't do that. And you have to do your best to avoid that. So you as a field underwriter, you are starting the underwriting uh, process. How do you start it? The same question you're going to ask on the application, the underwriter is going to ask them the question again. So that's why you are the field underwriter, because you're starting the underwriting process. Make sense? 
and come back here and say, know this, a life insurance producer is the company field underwriter. So if field underwriter, you are the agent. Okay, know that. You can be a test question. If not an employer agent, that's a field underwriter. Why they call them that? Because you're in the field, you're taking the, the, the question. If you have this, if you have either question, if you're taking the question, so therefore you are a field underwriter. So you have to help them to put the, the proper solicitation to the applicant, helping them prevent adverse selection, also completing the application and obtaining um, the requirement signature and also collecting the initial premium and issue them a policy a receipt. And after that, if they're gonna approve you delivering the policy. So that's why you are. Oh, here's the agent report down here. I already covered that, so I'm not going to this. And if you want, you can read that. The agent report is right here as well. Is a personal observation, okay, that you put in just in case if they tell you something otherwise, you wanna report it to the insurance company. All right, then if you do, FYI, if you are in our, in, in our company, please send it to your default, please. Don't do it, just do it COD. If you know what the COD for, you talk to me after I tell you what that is. If you have a pretty good change, think, think the person not gonna get approved, please send it to COD. All right? And sometime automatically come to COD anyway. All right, so I'm gonna cover this, uh, this next thing here, but let me just give you guys like five minutes break, then after that, we can come back in five minutes, okay? So it's 7.02, then come back in five minutes. So 7, 7.07 7 and come back. And then we can finish that, okay? Hi. All right then. All right, so I'm back. Okay, Alex, you here? My friends? Yes. All right. I'm here. All right. Okay, so let's continue with this. Let's see if I have control here still. Okay. All right. So now, let's go about uh, requiring a signature. Who should sign the application? Well, it depends. Sometimes, going to need two signatures. Sometimes, you're going to need three signatures. How would I know RVP when to, they're going to need three signatures? Well, if the policy owner, okay, and the insured is not the same, we're gonna need two signatures because the insured and the agent always have to sign. Okay, both the agent and the proposed insured have to sign the application. Okay, but sometimes the insured and the policy owner is not the same. So that's when it will require a third signature. Let's say that if I do a policy on Let's say I'm not the client, okay? Let's say me and, uh, and Alex, and let's say we're husband and wife again. And now Alex, you are the agent. If you do the policy for us, now you have to sign, Alex. My friends have to sign and I have to sign because if I'm the owner, I have to sign to agree to put the policy on my friends. And my friends also have to agree that I put the policy on her. Then Alex sends you the agent, you witness this, and then you sign. Now, if my friends they don't just go get the policy from you straight from you, Alex, only two signatures. You are my friend sign and you sign. Because the contract in between, not the agent, okay, you representing the company. Remember that. So the contract gonna be between the policy owner and the company. So if the company is X, XYZ company, so that's mean I'm gonna have the contract with XYZ company. So the agent is bound because the once the agent does it, now if they do something wrong, the company gonna can go after the agent. But actually, the you representing the company, you should act on behalf of the company. If something goes wrong, so we're gonna go straight after the company. We don't care about you, agent. You have nothing. So we ain't gonna go sue you. You have nothing. You butt naked. So we're gonna go after the big box, which is the insurance company. All right. So that's when you know signature what's required. Question on the signature part. Good. No. All right. <clears throat> the next thing is changes in the application. What will happen if I made a mistake in the application? You know that things happen. I can make a mistake. So if you have a question that was supposed to be answered and that is to be corrected, you as an agent, you can answer the correct question. You can put it down on the application. You can do that. But you have to personally have the applicant initially, not you. The agent can never put the initial, even though it's that simple. Well, 
For example, uh, Marie uh, Saint Germain. That's I can just put MS. That's easy. Ernest Joseph. I can just put EJ. And then that's easy. I can do it for them. No, you can't. You can't. You can't do that. It's unacceptable. Okay, you can do that. So you can put the right information, but you always need, all the time, the applicant have to do that. Now, this is what they trick you. You can't never, ever, I wish I could use this highlighter here. You can ever, ever do this. Right here, teammates. You can never do that. An agent should never erase or white out any information in the application. If there's a mistake, best thing you can do Destroy the whole application, start a brand new one. You can never, ever do that. So I just highlight that for you. So can you do it dry anyways? You know those little white out thing? You can't use that. Never. It's a contract. It's, it's gonna be illegal. What happens if I put the initial RVP? If I use the white, no, they say you can never do that. It's that simple. If there is a mistake, you can destroy it, start a brand new one, or if it is on a, a paper application, have the, you can put the right information, but the applicant must initiate. it. That's how you fix it. Consequences for incomplete application. Well, sometimes when you send the application is, is incomplete, there's a consequences. Well, it will delay the process. Okay, you might take longer to get coverage. You might even get the process where you get denied. So you have to make sure you do it the right way. That's some consequences that can happen. So what about collection the initial premium? Number four, so you're gonna collect the initial premium, the initial mean first premium, okay? And you have to issue, issue them a receipt, what we call it, the, if they say, so into do a policy, and they have to um, give them a receipt, what does that call? This call a premium receipt, a premium receipt. Or they can call it must come and type this conditional receipt. If that's when there's a conditional receipt, that's when certain condition must be met. Certain condition must be met that we just said earlier. Sometimes it's, they might ask you, if that's the case, let's read this paragraph here. I think this probably important. This is probably important right here. Let me just see if I can highlight this for you. Oops, oops, oops. Not that. Just highlight this little part here. Let's see. Okay. All right, now, the most common type of uh, receipt is conditional receipt. Sometimes they will use that in the exam, which is only used when the applicant sub submit a prepaid application. Because when you submit it with the money, you send it prepaid. So the conditional receipt says that the coverage will be effective. So if they ask what is the purpose of the conditional receipt, because the coverage will be expected either on the date of the application or the date of the examination, whichever occurs last. So whichever happened uh, done at the end, that's what's gonna happen, okay? They, they found to be insurable as a standard risk of the policy. Now we didn't cover that yet, and then we're gonna make sure we, we cover that with you guys later, okay? So now, is issue exactly the same the way I applied for it, or it might be issue decline, or it can be rated. Rated means they're charging more money or they can issue them with a writer that is specific in the coverage, maybe something better, okay? So now in the exam, they give you a scenario, somebody that applied for a policy, they send the money in, but they have to do an examination two weeks later, so when does coverage begin? The date of the examination, whichever is later, because they pay the premium, if it's not the date of the application, it's the date of the examination, whichever is later, and that's the test question. That's the test question. So that could be in your exam. Not 100% sure, but it could. Question on that? So far, so? All right. So you guys can you read that, that example here and so on. Okay, let's see. This one said, know this, know this. Um, in Florida, they don't even give us the little feedback. You see, they love at Alex up there. Let's show you this st stuff. Let's show you guys this. Conditional receipt means the applicant may be covered as early as the date of what? The application. 
at the end of the application. So it's the date of application or the date of the examination, whichever is later, whichever is later. Replacement, what does replacement mean? Well, if somebody doing a replacement teammate, okay? So that's when you have something already. If you got something, you're going to replace it. That's when you have an old thing. You're gonna let that existing thing go and you're gonna get something brand new. And now, once you're doing this, replacement get to place. And now, once you're doing replacement, it's highly regulated. It's highly regulated. So you have to make sure if you're replacing somebody, policy, you have to give them enough information to make an informed decision. So you cannot just tell them, hey, let me just replace your policy because now I'm, I'm licensed, let me do your policy for you. No, if somebody had a policy before, you have to make sure you do what's best for them. You have to give them more value than what they already have. If you don't, cannot bring them more value, don't devalue what they have. Replacement get replaced. Underwriting. So we're done with this part. Let's go to the next topic. See. Underwriting. What is underwriting? Now let's go to that. Underwriting is a process. If, you were, if I was going to give you the underwriting uh, definition, you can write it down. Okay? Underwriting is the process of selection, classification, weighting or weighted of risk. That's underwriting. So I need to say that again. Underwriting is the process of selection classification and rating of risk. So all this mumbo jumbo here, I'll just rephrase it for you. What's come up that classification? Classification rating or weighted of risk. What they're saying is the underwriting is the process. When I say a process is a step by step. Um, I could not understand when I was in school, they were making me the, you know, there is process essay, they have processive essay, informative essay, all this crap. I was saying, what the heck am I learning all this crap for? I didn't care about none of that. But they say, well, they step, the process essay was the best one. I said, oh, yeah. So that's me. I can, I can just use that by computer. I can teach you how to put, do the whole thing. This is how you this, the on button, you do this, you do that, step by step. You cannot, so you don't turn, the, turn on the computer and then you see, you start trying to use the mouse or start typing. You're crazy. Okay, you have to do one step at a time. <laughs> okay, that's what the process is. So a process, okay, is selection. The first thing when you send an application in, they select the people they're going to get. They select them. That's in selection. So the underwriting, they select the people. That you as the person, you can't do that. The agent have no right to select the proposed insured or the client. You're not allowed to do that. That's discrimination. You can't do that. Discrimination is not legal. You select them. After you select them, and they classify them. When they classify them, there is three class. That's what we call classification. Three class. It's either they preferred, they standard, or substandard. So now, depend what class they fall into, Alex, and they're going to tell them how much they're going to rate them. Rate means how much they're going to pay every month. That's called weight, money. All right, I think that's good. Hopefully I didn't get you guys done, so all right. So now, the purpose of underwriting is to protect the insurer against what? Adverse selection, risks which are more likely to suffer a loss. So that's the reason they go check in my bid because, excuse me, some people still lie about their health. So now the adverse selection, it's there. But because of that, they don't want to, you know, they want to protect the insurance company. But at the same time, they cannot say, oh, let me just get everybody in good health, like Ernest. Oh, yeah, Ernest is in good health. So let's get all Ernest. So we never have to be deaf. No, boy. You can't do that neither, insurance companies. That's why we have rules. We have laws. We can't do that. Now, so you just, what? You just going to come to collecting money? You don't want to pay nothing? No, people are going to die too. So doesn't mean because somebody substandard, you're not going to take some. You better take some. Okay. Insurable interest, I explained that already. It's the possibility of losing something of value, which is money. Okay. But most, when must insurable interest exist at the time of the application? At the time of the application. Let's say, go back to the same example with uh, my friends. Let's say that me and my friends say we're going to get married next week. 
Or let's say tomorrow. I don't care. Monday. No, tomorrow is Sunday. Monday. The court is closed. We're going to go to the court. We're going to get married. Okay, my friends, on Monday. Now, because of that, you say, oh, since that agent come to us today, say, oh, well, Alexi, Alexi, well, since you guys are going to get married on Monday, so why don't you guys get the policy today? No, you can do that. That's a no, no. That's a no, no. Okay, I do know if I'm not going to change my mind by Monday, which is most likely I will change my mind. <laughs> okay. That's not so that's what that means at the time of the application. So you have to make sure the insurance just exists at the time of the application. But now, once we get go to the court on Monday, everything done. Oh yeah, go ahead. You can do that right there. Once we get that document taken, girl, girl, you have me. Now you can put it under. Now Alex will ready for you, girl. Now because Alex now wanna get some money so quick, they said no, 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 let's do it today because I need to get paid. But that Monday, I need to get a real girl. Get it today, honey. No, 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 no. <laughs> Uh-uh, 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 ain't gonna happen, okay? Same thing with a business owner, same way. Oh, well, if we're gonna start, let's say three of us, uh, my friends, Alex, Emion, let's say you guys say you're gonna go up in the business. Each one of you gonna come with $10,000, okay? If one of you pass away, you're gonna affect the other person, um, 10000 So one of you mixing they have to put insurance on you? Yeah, because if you, you ask them to come do a business together, then you pass away, now you let us hang in. So, and then probably you are the brand, so you make me put my money at risk. So we're gonna put the insurance on each other, baby. So uh, my friend's gonna put one on you, my friend's gonna put one on the Elmian, Elmian's gonna put one on Alex, Alex's gonna put one on Elmian, then uh, you're gonna do cross purchase, okay? So that's gonna be a total of six policy combined. But now until we have the business started, we can't do that. If the business is starting next month, well, we have to wait for next month, guys. That's what that means at the time of the application, at the time of the application, not at the time of loss, not when the person passed away, no, at the time of the application, the insurable interest must exist. And you also give you some, this, this how who have insurable interest and what, I would explain that to you, okay? And I did explain to you why the key person insurance is important, okay? Know this, insurable interest must exist at the time of the application, okay? And I say, no, this as well, the policy only must have insurable interest into the life of the insured. So now, that's the reason I say, I cannot put the insurance on any of you guys' kids because now, if something happens to any of your kids or if something happens to any of my kids, it will hurt you, okay? But it will not affect you financially. Say, oh man, if something happened to me right now, since I'm your uh, offline, I say so, if something happened to me right now, would it affect your money? No, it's not. You're gonna feel bad that I didn't get a chance to train you. You didn't get a chance to know me more, help you more, but that's it. So that's what that means. The policy must, because if I put the policy in you, what am I losing of value? Because if I'm not losing anything, not, don't worry about feelings. They're not gonna care about feelings at that time. When people pass away, man, you know, nobody care about feelings. They just bring the money. We need to do that feeling up, and we need to take care of the rest of the bills. And that was gonna affect us. So we need to make sure we do that. Now, for you, that guy have our Haitian people, they say, every time you try to put insurance on a Haitian person, for example, they might say, well, we want to kill me, blah, blah, blah. I mean, come on. Come on. The reason we got to do that because we have insurable interest. If you, something happens to you, I'm going to have to take $30,000 from my 401k money or my saving account that I didn't have to do that then to go take care of that. So why don't we just transfer the risk to the insurance company and that would just pay them $100 a month. It's that simple. It's that simple. All right. Next step. Any question on that? Source of underwriting information. So how do they go by doing the underwriting? Number one, the first place they go, I said where? The application. That's the first thing. And you can see, know this. An insurance application is the key source of underwriter. Okay. It use the information about the applicant. So the first place they go check is the application. The second thing they can check the agent report, even though this is personal observation, like I said, hey, I asked the client, do you smoke? Say no, but I saw he got a cigarette. Uh, well, guess what? I didn't want to say they smoke, and I put the no, but what's that? Oh no, not you. Okay, so that's what that is, okay? That's the agent report. And then the next thing they can go is an investigation report. That's called an inspection report. Now, you're gonna find two reports out there that's kind of get people confused. Is an investigation report and a consumer report. 
Now, I want you to get this very simple. A consumer report is came from a database. When you file, let's say, for a credit card and they try to uh, you're applying for a loan, they don't do an inspection report unless you're, I don't know, you, you, you're that bad and they want to investigate you. But other than that, they don't do that. They do a consumer report. That's when they take it, that information from a database. Okay? So that's mean it's not something where they go talk to family and friends. But now this one, investigation report, consumer report, is where they go, they probably talk to your neighbor, your family, people that, that knows you, and to find out who you are. So that's when they can get that A. That's an inspection and investigation consumer report. That's the difference between those two reports, and they can go get those things. Fair Credit Reporting Act, well, is the same way. Now, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, they have to make sure what they report on your credit report, on your consumer report, they're fair, they're accurate, uh, you know, they're relevant. They don't just put whatever they want because now I heard a lot of people crying. They say, like, company been reporting crap that they should not be reporting. So there's a lot of chaos out there. But at the end of the day, it's just like you have to stay on top of your game. So you have to make sure sometimes they might put something on your report that's not accurate, that's not true. And maybe they might say they give you a prescription. The person might have the same name with you and the same last name, same first name, except they may have the same social. But at the end of the day, like, well, the mistake happened. They report you got sick and you are taking this type of prescription for high blood pressure. And now you can no longer qualify for the coverage. So now you need to find out is the information is accurate. So that's why they have to make sure everything is fair, okay, confidential, accurate, and relevant to, you know, and also proper use. So that's called a fair recording, um, uh, reporting act. Now, you have to know why they come with this law. Is The law is there to protect consumers against circulation of inaccurate or absolute information. So you have to know the purpose they come with this. So if they come with this law, that's when the company was doing a lot of bad things. Okay, it's not because if they were that good, they would never come with the rule. So because something was happening, then there's a, a law that's gonna come. Simple as that. So we talk about the investigation consumer report. Okay, that's when they go to families, they check you out, they, they find out things like that about you and so on. And if you violate this, okay, if you unknowingly violate this, the consequence is not as, as, as um, severe as if you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing is wrong, you do it, they're gonna charge you $2,500 penalty. Now it's not one time, every violation, every violation. So if you do that 10 times, well, by all means, good luck. Now, can anybody request this information? No, they can't, okay? Not anybody can, they're not available to anybody, okay? Let's go to the Medical um, Information Bureau, MIB. You might heard this term, MIB, okay? So this is another bureau, so it's a Medical Information Bureau. That's when it's collecting information about somebody health okay and it's a non-profit organization now he owned by the members of the insurance company so what happened is so now we have the fair credit and reporting act to protect the consumers well the insurance company said but those people it's not our fault it's based on our finding the report so the insurance company said well here's what we're going to do we're going to create this company called mib when you find something if you're part of this you report it to mib when I find something, the next a, 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 XYZ company finds something, you report it to MIB. Now, and if we need those information, any other of those companies that partner up, that a member of MIB, they can pull those information about the, those people that want to lie about the health history. So now, in order for it to be part of the MIB, I'm sure there's a fee for it. If it's done properly, how does it make money? Well, it makes money with those folks right here, with the members of the insurance company. They get funded by this. It's not profit, but they get they get they make money right here. All right, make sure you know that. So that's how it might be get funded right here. If you if you stay, if you can see that. Oops. So they do their whole thing right there. That's how they get funded. And no, it's a non-profit organization, and the purpose is to protect to assist the underwriting process, to help to assist underwriters with the process, in case they want to lie. It can start the selection, so know that. Now, know this: insurer cannot refuse coverage solely, okay, 
on the basis of adverse information in the MIB report. So that doesn't mean because they're finding the MIB, they say, oh, they're going to not. They, that's not. They need to find a little bit more. Make sure it's accurate. Okay. And sometimes they can also go to medical examination, find, you know, your um, prior medical report, maybe att attending physician statement. They can go to that as well to get some more information. And then that's also they use that a lot. They use that a lot. So at that time, um, the insurer must disclose the use of the testing to the applicant if they're going to test for you guys. When they go to test and they have to make sure to disclose, especially for the a um, a HIV, you know, before they do the test, they have to let you know they're going through the test. That's why sometimes they kind of ask you, hey, what test they're going to do? Everything. Everything, bro. Everything. No exception. So they have to establish a written policies and procedures, how they're going to do that internally to make sure, like, everybody can have, uh, you know, stay compliance. Now, HIPAA is another um, act that was created because it looks like people could not keep their mouth quiet when they find people sickness things that non-public information and they disclose this stuff and they don't want everything is confidential and whatever that's why I give people the privacy notice you know to protect health information of about people so you, you you know you cannot disclose them and like for you um alex who's in the medical field you know if you find people that sick so that's part of it so you can't be disclosed those information they have to keep them private that will probably the only question I'll answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, even when I was at this distribution, they used to do this. Um, whatever. I say, I distribution. What the heck is gonna do the anything? But whatever. But they used to make us do that because what happened is sometimes because um we have the the RX uh, information it come back to us to our to the DC and we have to make sure we protect the stuff. They come in with the, with the, in the blue band and we have to make sure them. Proper, properly dispose them so to avoid, um, you know, identity theft. Also, people that can take those information. We don't want that to get to the wrong hand. So that's that's been not a big deal. So we have to protect people information here. Yeah. Uh, Swiss classification. There's three ways you classify the Swiss. Based on your class, that's based on how they're gonna charge you. There's three classes: standard, substandard, and preferred. Those are the three. Now, standard, they might ask you, where would you find most people? Most people, standard. It's okay, most people are standard, okay? Substandard is people who's not in good health. Their health is a little bit more poor than their standard. But who, who pay more money? Substandard. Now, some people might say, well, that's a nice word, substandard. I think that that's superior. No, no, that's been substandard, under. Underperform your health is underperformed, so they charge you more money, and you can get declined as well. So at the minute you smoke, you become sub substandard. It's that simple. That doesn't mean you're sick, but because you of your smoke, you substandard. Okay, that's just an example. Standard. That's when you find the majority of the people. And preferred, if you are a preferred customer, that's when things are a little bit cheaper. So which of the following pay the lowest premium? Preferred. Which one pay the highest premium? Substandard. Which one representing the majority of the people? Standard. All right. As you can see, they're right here. If you want to read them, get more information. Any question on that? No. All right. So now remember the underwriting is the process of selection. They select them first. Then they classify them three classes. That's where classification comes from. Then once they classify them, and they're going to tell them how much they're going to pay premium. They're going to say, hey, you're going to pay this much. That's called rating or rated. Okay, that's the process. That's how they're underwriting. Then once that go through, you get approved, and they return the policy back to you, and you take it from there. Now, every rule, that's why some people don't like English, to be honest with you, because they never respect rule. I can believe this country. They just tell you to respect everything, but at the end, they always have a but. But what? There is, remember, I tell you, in order for you to be the policy in somebody, the person must be having sober interest. But this concept violates the sober interest concept. Equally, stranger, as you can see, it's like the bad words, a stranger 
originated life insurance, that's called a stolly policy. That's an investor originated life insurance. They can call it stolly or I-O-L-I, -I, which is investor originated life insurance policy. That's somebody who's in the business of buying insurance for a profit as an investor. Somebody might have a policy, they cannot handle it. Maybe they have a life to insect that. Remember, the insurance, when you buy it, teammates, it's like an asset. Just like you have a car, you can buy your, if you have your own car, what can you do with it? I can sell it. I can destroy it. Okay, I can give it to somebody. I can transfer the rights to someone else because it's my car. I can decide buy it, do whatever. I can assign it to do. So a policy is an asset in the same way because it can turn to money. So how can you, you can, the person can take the policy, they have a life to insignia, they take it and sell it to a totally different person. And that new investor become the owner of the policy, but they have no such of insurable interest. So if they ask you which concept violates insurable interest, is that concept solely. So if they say, you know, a, a original uh, um, or solely policy is violated, they what? The insurable interest concept. So as you can see right here, if I was here, I write this note down here, all the way to here. Bam. That's what that is. Solely policy violated the principle of insurable interest. So if you know what insurable interest is, it's valid that it have no respect for it. I don't care you're a stranger. I, I don't care. I don't know you. You're a stranger. Completely. Hey, that's the only way. Now, why you can do all this? Because back in the day, teammates, yeah, you know, some people used to find homeless people that didn't have that much money, and they need help. And then people used to put insurance on them. And after that, they go in the back end and kill them, and collect them. So that's why you see a lot of rules, those things come in. So it's no joke, man. Are you gonna change my color, Alexandra? Is that what you're doing? Oh no, I thought you put it out. No. I'm just <laughs> I was asking you, asking you know it, girl. You can, it, you can exit it. Okay, I'll just mess you with you, girl. <laughs> Hopefully not slipping on me, okay? Uh-huh. All right, so now that's what happened. So that's the only way you can put the policy on somebody if you not have no insurance interest. It's only if that case. If it is an investor that buy that policy because of a large settlement. So because the person can no longer handle the policy and they sell it away. And they have to write, they can do that. Okay? So now no insurable interest needs to be in place. So remember that. Just remember that. Okay? E deliver policy. So now we're gonna finish with this section. You're gonna say how why you deliver the policy. Okay. Well. There is different ways. So you can e-deliver the policy. A lot of companies do that electronically. Right now, I think it's e-delivery will be the biggest part of our business, the insurance business these days. Why? Hey, social distancing. Now most companies can go online. Everything will be electronically. But is that the only way you deliver the policy? Nope. But at the end of the day, you have to send the delivery receipt that to prove that the, everything was done. You, the person got the policy, they accept it, and you take it from there. So you can also e-deliver the policy. Why should the agent deliver the policy? Why as an agent? Why would that deliver it? Well, there's different reasons. What happened if the policy provisions, which we don't cover them yet, okay? Provision like, let's say they, uh, it's like, you maybe they don't understand what the reinstatement is, okay? Uh, maybe what irrevocable beneficiary is, what irrevocable means. So there is some terms that come with the policy, what the grace period is, okay? Ensuring goods, consideration. Then when I know provision are things that are standard into the policy. You're gonna find them from one company to the next. Okay, so maybe you have to explain that to them. Maybe there's some riders in there. Maybe a waiver of premium rider. Maybe a guarantee insurability rider. Maybe a payer benefit rider. Okay, maybe an accidental death rider. Maybe a spouse rider, a children term rider. So it might, you might have some a rider in there and then now they need explanation. Maybe there's an exclusion. If you die being a pilot or maybe a student pilot, or maybe you're in the military, those things are not covered. So you explain to them why those things are not covered. Or maybe the worst thing that can happen, the policy end up being substandard. They charge them more money than they expect. So now because of that, you need to explain to them why that happened. The reason you do it personally is just to make sure they understand the contract. 
That's why you deliver it. So now, on the exam, if they say how they can deliver it, one say mail only. That's not the right answer. Or maybe they put electronically only. That's not the answer. So now, or face-to-face -face only. That's not the answer. Because the answer is all of the above. All of the above. You can do it electronically. You can do it face-to-face. -face, you can mail it. So all of them come together. Personally, that, make sure you know that. So they try to trick you there. Buyer's guide. What is the buyer's guide? If you are going to buy a car, for example, the first thing you're going to see, uh, if you're buying here, pay here, they say as is. No warranty. That's the buyer's guide. As is, no warranty. If you, were, you buy that baby, you say, man, I love that baby. And then you start driving it and mess up. Right after that, guess what? They told you it was as is. They say, what's the used car? There's no warranty. As is. They give you the guide. Now, the way I explain this to people for them to understand, let's say that you're going to go buy a car. And now you're debating. Should I get a, a Toyota? Should I get a Honda? Or should I get a Nissan? Now, at the end of the day, you're debating. Now, those car, excuse me, they have different, they cost differently. Maybe the Honda might cost more money than the Toyota. Maybe the Toyota might cost more than the Nissan. But now you know, understand, hey, if I get the Toyota, I will pay this much in the middle. And if I take the Honda, it's going to cost me more money. Now you just doing it by its guide. Now there's some features the Honda might have, the Toyota doesn't. Okay? You might see the, 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 the Honda might be a little bit more comfortable when it comes to the sitting and everything. A very comfortable car. But the Toyota, the features may not be the same. It might be a little bit tighter, you know, differently. Um, you can find that in there. Okay? And the Nissan, you know, you not like the way shape or whatever, but you know what I mean. And then they they just give you the guide, okay. But eventually you have to make a decision to pick one. Then you decided, well, I'm gonna go get the Honda. So once you purchase that Honda into the parking lot, and now that's the car you purchase. So now the salesman gonna come give you everything about, tell you everything about, about it before you make that final decision. Once you make the final decision, they give you a summary about it. The summary will tell you all the features and benefit about it. Well, that's when you find out this Honda have GPS. This Honda have a DVD. But all of them probably have an AM, FM radio. Okay? But this Honda, maybe you just like, it tell you exactly how much is it, how much is the payment, if you finance it, how much is the, uh, the interest they're going to charge you? So the summary only gets done when you buy. If the purchase never gets done, you, you are doing this. Guide. The buyer's guide, you didn't buy nothing. So those are basic information. It tells you different type of policies, okay? That's what that does. It tells you what the difference between the whole life, term, variable life, universal life, blah, 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 how much they can cost. But once you pick which one you get, and that's when you get the summary, you say, well, since now I got the term policy, it tell you exactly how it works. It tell you how much the premium. It tell you what is the surrender value. It means specific. Anything specific is the policy summary. Anything general is the bias guide. And you must give the person the bias guide before you collect the initial premium. You don't say, oh, give me the money. Then I'll, I'll explain it to you how it works first. No, you explain it to them how it works. You give them the guide. Then... You, you, before it's collected first question. Okay? Now, the only way, there is a little leeway on that. Now, if the policy comes with at least 10 days freely paid, if they can look the policy for at least 10 days or more, you know how to give them the buyer's guide because they still can get it looked for free for 14 days now. In, in Florida, I know it's 14 days. Uh, I'm not sure in this state of, um, in, uh, we, once we get to that page, Alexandra, you can check for your state. It might be 14 days as well. It may be 30 days. I'm not sure. But in Florida, we got 14 days. The person can look up the policy for free. Once the policy have, have at least 10 days, once you have at least 10 days of free look period, you don't have to give them the guide. And just remember, you can give it to them when you deliver the, the, deliver the policy. So now, a test question might can work like this. So-and-so purchase a policy. 
But he didn't have a chance to give them the bias guide. When would they be able to get one? Well, when you deliver the policy. As long as they send this free look, because they still have 10 days to make up their mind. If they don't want it, they can return it. They got a full refund. Now, what about the sum summary? Always get the summary when you deliver the policy. See, policy summary must be provided when you deliver the policy. Because if they didn't get approved, do you get them a summary? No, you don't. No, you don't. Just know this. A bias guide provides generic information about various types of policies. But now, a policy summary provides specific information. Now you know exactly who's covered. Alexandria, Malifons. How much she paying? 100 bucks a month. What is the coverage? 100,000. Which company? For America. Which company she got? AIG. You name it. Now you know exactly what they're referring to. That's the summary. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, you might get that in the last two chapters as well. They get, might go back to those things. Okay, that's right. If you get it now, you're going to get it later as well. Now, the term illustration. What does illustration mean? An illustration is presentation. When you see you come into one of our briefings, that's a presentation. Now, this is all, these are non guarantee okay? So when you're doing this, you have to make sure all these bullets are true right here, okay? When you're doing that, the uh, illustration, it must distinguish between guarantee and projected amounts. Clearly state that the illustration is not part of the contract and identify those values are not guaranteed. So this is an illustration. That's illustration is a presentation or depiction that includes non-guaranteed element of the policy. All right? So an agent may only use the illustration of the insurer that has been approved. So if it's not approved, you cannot use it. So now another way you can find a test question teammates is right here. When does coverage begin? Now, uh, for that purpose of this, let's just look at this illustration. The way you gotta know when the coverage begins is this. You gotta ask yourself some question. Was the premium received at the time of the application? Did the person pay the proposal or the policy owner? Because the policy owner have to pay for the policy. So did the premium, do they pay when you do the application? If it is yes, okay. What about if it is no, then you go to the next thing. Was the policy issue? That's the next question. You see it right here. If you say yes, was the policy issue? If it is yes, then you're gonna be the deal of the application. Now, if it is no, then you pay, was the policy issue? If they give them the policy and it's yes, and now you have to collect the premium and you also gotta get what we call a statement of good health. So now there's a the saying say no premium, no coverage. If you didn't pay, you're not covered. So now that's what the con conditional receipt said. Hey, listen, when we send this, if you send money, you cover with condition. When you send no money, you not cover pay. No money, no love, no you name it. Okay, you're not covered. If you die then in the process, if this person passed away, teammates, they won't pay that. They won't pay that their claim. But if this person now they send the premium and pass away in the process, they're gonna pay that. Imagine my friend who just passed away in the motorcycle accident. Let's say if I did do a policy, for example, and then in the process, he was not going to do the test yet, but an accident like that happened, and now charge and he passed away, but unfortunately they have to pay. Even though they didn't go, hey, you have to pay. He was not sick. If, if he was not dying in the motorcycle accident, he was going to get the policy, so they must pay. But if he did not send the money, unfortunately, you are the lock. That's why you have to send a good faith deposit as an agent to make sure you let the client know, hey, it's okay to send the money. If you don't get approved, they will return it back to you. So that's when they start the coverage begin. And those are, you can find those on your exam. No big deal. Date of the application or date of delivery. Okay? So that's in case. This one is in case they don't pay. Now, date of the application, now that's if they pay the money and they don't have to do the examination. But if they have to do the examination, it's going to either be the date of the application or the date of the examination, whichever is later. Remember that. Always, yes, I'll be. Why? After you just say the date of the action, the date of delivery. Yes, I understand that. But if they have to do the exam, teammates, so now you already pay, so you cannot get the date of the application because we don't know if they're going to give it to you. So you have to wait after you do the examination process. Then, if you don't have to do no examination, then it's going to be the date of the application. 
But if you, you have to do examination, N is the date of the examination, whichever is later. Now, if you don't send the money, you have to collect at delivery. If you go deliver the policy and the person do not have the money, then you should not give them the policy. Your job is to make sure you collect the money and also a statement in the days you are instilling the help. Because I don't know, two weeks ago, and while we were in the process, maybe a month ago, if you were not sick, if you were not at the hospital. Now, especially right now with this crazy COVID-19, I don't know that. So therefore, hey, you got to give me a statement that you're seeing good health. Then coverage begin. Okay? Then coverage begin. And now, I think this is probably the last thing I'm going to cover here is this right here. Um, Alexandra, where were you back September 11, 2001? Where were you? Were you in the country? Out of the country? Alexandra, where were you? 2011? Yeah, 2011, where were you? Haiti. Haiti. But the, have you heard about when the two airplanes crashed in New York and killed a bunch of people? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's called 9-11. 9-11 happened. Now, okay, that was in 2011, okay? I mean, I mean, 2001, sorry. Okay, 2001, when that happened. So now, it was in September, so an accident happened. So now, after a lot of research done, they believe that it was because terrorism attack. So now, the issue, like I say, something has to happen for something else to happen. They, every time something bad happens, they're going to come with rules and regulations. So they believe that was that the case. Now, this... Um, when that happened, teammates, they come in with this act. It called USA Patriot Act. And it's something that you're going to know if you're in the baking industry and you have to comply with this act. It was back in October 26, 2001, when that, they put that act to place. So they want to try to avoid anti-money laundering. So you can see it right here, AML. So now, it's just like some people, like if you go to the financial um, arena and you try to get some money out, depending how much money it is, they're going to ask you for your ID. If you're going to do a transfer, if you send a lot of money back home, and once it starts passing like five grand, and they're going to ask you for ID. And then if they, at least probably 10 or more, they're going to have to file a report to fence into if they feel like it's a superstitious activity you're doing. And they're going to report it to fence in. Fence in is a, uh, is a network where they try to monitor people from doing, you know, ter terrorism attack to, to, the, to the people. They don't want the same thing that happened 9-11. Um, they don't want the same thing to happen. So they want to make sure, hey, if you feel like that's somebody doing superstitious activity, you have to do a SAR report. A SAR report is a superstitious, no, yeah, activity report. It's a SAR. So what you do, if you feel like, let's say you ask the person, hey, I need your ID. And you see, it's $5,000 or more, but some places it might be $10,000, because I have all the books, it's $10,000 10, or more. But this one, for the person at this exam right now, they started with 5,000. If you do the application, you feel like the person gonna, can, you feel that's what they're doing, and you have to report it to FinCEN, you have to do that report, okay? Now, the reason they have to do that because you can also see some red flag. Let's say somebody you go, um, you ask them for ID. Let's say you're doing a policy for somebody, and then you ask them for the ID, and their ID doesn't match. It doesn't look like them, either. none of this stuff. So you have to be careful, you have to be careful. They're using fake IDs, okay? Maybe mm. they have um, two or more customers using the same similar ID, okay? That's why you see sometimes when you go to a bank and you try to adjust money, they ask you for your ID, please don't get mad with them. This we're just doing the job. Because if they don't, they can get in trouble. All right, if you find that can happen, you have 30 days to report that, to do the report. If you feel this, you don't feel well about it, you don't feel okay about it, and you have the right to report it. So that's what this is. And at the end, there's a little review here, and that's a recap for you guys. And I think that's all for this chapter. Any questions? No, for me, no.
Wisdom. All right, so that's that. Now, every time I do a session, okay, let's, mm -hmm. let's do this. There's a 15 uh, question quiz, and let's see how much you retain. All right, and now I want you guys to unmute yourself, and then whoever can answer first, go ahead and pick it out, and then you can shout it. If it is the right one, and we'll take it from there. Okay, that's, that's it. Ready? You wanna try that, guys? Ready? Alex, Marco, yeah. make sure you're not, yeah, make sure there's not too much noise. Uh, AM, you and hopefully you guys can unmute you. Please shout out the answer. Okay. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Shout out. Whoever gets the answer, shout it out. I'm just going to put it just like little test prep with you. See if you retain how much you retain from that. I question you still here. Probably sleeping. <laughs> she probably fell asleep. You know? General information. No, agent report. Okay, you say the agent report? Yeah. Okay, let's see what the question say. Say, which part of the insurance application would contain information regarding the cause of death of the applicant deceased relatives? Hold on. Regarding the cause of death of the applicant deceased relatives. Medical information. Yes. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, because they want to know, hey. <laughs> so people with with the uh, uh, cardiovascular problem. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. That's why I go back after I read it. I'm like, no, medical information. <laughs> yes. I got a tapsy or something to see. Oh, Evan, you're here. Finally, I got my even back. Oh, Lord have mercy. Oh, oh my God, my God, Ernst. <laughs> oh, she's here. I thought that was a ghost in here. Jesus, man, girl, you scared me. Anyway. Yes, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Next one. Is the next one. You can read it and see what happens. D. Yeah, I'll go with D too. Go with <laughs> no! I said try again. I didn't say go put that. You should try again. <laughs> if you put D, that the summary, that's when the policy is issued. Really? The policy is issued. You've been specific. That's what you're buying. Wow. That's, wow. That's in your mind. So it's allowed the consumer buy, to buy. cost and different policy. Alexandra, you can go ahead and click next. Oh my goodness. I like it's okay to miss, to miss it now. And the exam. One second. One second. Let me. Oh, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. The cost. What happened? Yes. It ain't next. What is it doing? Okay, go ahead. Here. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Unilateral. I better get that right. All right, let's see. In, in insurance policy, the insurer is not legally bound to any particular 
Is there any if in that sentence? If this happened, this will happen. Is there any of that on that? Is it? Okay, let me read it again. Find if you see any if in there. If there's no if, that may not be right. Is there any if in there? I F? Oh no. no. So that's never be right. I know it's not B, it's not C. So I'm guessing between A and D. But there's no if. In order for it to be D, you have to have if on it. There's no if in that sentence. And the question. <laughs> so it's A. That's C. <laughs> no, it can't be C. Oh, my first woke up. What? Where are you, girl? <laughs> I, was, I was just sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> the kids just making noise. I couldn't say nothing. Oh, I think, girl, man, I thought you were already like dreaming, having like, like, you know, <laughs> that's <laughs> too nice. <laughs> Okay. Oh my goodness. How's the A? <laughs> four. Just second guess yourself. <laughs> That's for where? <laughs> okay. Because remember, the conditional, there's no if. You see, if you're with this sentence, is there any if? Is there any condition in here? No. He doesn't say. He just, just say, hey, this is what that is. That's it. There's no condition. That's why it's not this. Yeah, because I write this down. I'm like, okay, it has to be on here. Oh my God. Mm. The next one. I will say B. C. C. Uh, okay, somebody say B and C. Let's see. If an insurance company wishes to order a consumer report on an applicant, applicant and assist the underwriting process, and if a notice of insurance information practice has been provided, the report contains all of the following information except the applicant. Who said B? Who said B? Anybody said B? B as in boy? Yeah, I did say B, but let me hold on, hold on, wait. Because <laughs> all of this should like prior. I said, I said C. <laughs> uh, ancestry, I do they not go with ancestry? What is this? What is this word? Yes, I know it. And so you know this, that's when they go back to our old parents and things like yeah, that. Yeah, like why would they go with that? A discrimination. That's yes. What oh. <laughs> that's what come to my mind. I'm like, why would they go to my ancestry? Yeah. They would do discrimination, that's why they'll go there. Next one. And what I want you guys to do is to go to your 
you can pass and go to that chapter and go do the quizzes yourself after that. You can take it as many times as you want. So if you have like this chapter, this one you should get it down pat now, should be good. Hmm. I say B, I'm not sure. I know it can be A, I don't know. I mean, it can be D, but I'll go with B. Let's see if I'm out of luck. Which one? I'll go with B. B as in boy? Yeah. Nice one. Somebody else vote on. Damien, what you got done good for? Anybody else? I guess nobody get it. Oh, we both see. Okay. Emion, you didn't say anything. I know. Uh, um, I heard. D. C. Who said D? Anybody said D as in dog? A small amount of no. phone. No. So anybody say D as a dog? Well, I go with B. Uh, yeah. Wait, B. Yeah. Where bingo? A small amount, a hundred. Remember the, the scenario I gave you. Uh, when you pay a hundred for one hundred and fifty thousand, they're not equal. Because small doesn't equal to large. Make sense? Is the next one? 